Hello everyone, my name is Christoph Thomas. Um, I'm at the University of Bayreuth in Germany and I'll be giving this presentation with Karl Lepo, my postdoc, who's gonna go actually in the second part of the talk. So what I would like to do now is get you out of the aquatic area and get you into the atmosphere and talk about how to use fiber optic sensing to sense wind direction and speed. And of course the challenge compared to some of the other presentations that were given um, just in the workshop is that the turbulent speeds are much faster and the turbulence is much more vigorous and has a chaotic signal. So to provide you with some motivation for the work, uh, let me see if I can actually advance the slides, is that a lot, of the a lot of the atmospheric processes in the very thin layer next to the surface, um, which we call the critical zone, are actually affected when the turbulence is very weak. Um, this, may infect the, uh, well, this may affect the um, spread of pollutions, exchange of greenhouse gases, formation of fog or frost damage to crops. So whenever the turbulence is very, well uh, is very weak, we don't understand it very well. Um, so the motions all of a sudden become 3D to 2D. The mixing is not continuous, but it actually it's intermittent and we just don't know where the mix actually comes from. Um, so one of the main suspects we've been researching over the past couple of years are the so-called sub scale motions that we were able to capture with artificially generated and released Falke on the right-hand side. And this basically, the idea is that the sub scale motions move through your domain and they generate this very intermittent and weak mixing. And as you can tell from the image, this, these motions have a very distinct and very complex spatial structure, which you simply don't get with these very simple point observations. So we have to move towards spatial observations. So um, within the dark mix project, which was funded by the ERC, uh, we tried several approaches to sensing the wind direction. This is what I'll talk about and Carl will talk about more about the wind speed. And here I would like to present what we call the microscopic approach. So let's assume we have two resistively heated fiber optic cables. We already learned about active uh, distributed temperature sensing. And we have some structures here in the shape of cones printed onto these cables. And assume we ex expose these two cables to a uh, flow speed and air speed. And you would probably think that because the structures, they do generate a little bit of turbulence, that the heat loss from these higher than temperature, the air temperature cables is actually different. So you'd expect a differential temperature signal, a differential because of the differential heat loss. So this is the main hypothesis that we tried. And we put this to, um, to testing in a wind tunnel because in a wind tunnel, we can actually very well are in charge. We can control the direction of the flow, the turbulence and also the wind, the, the wind speed. So the results that we got actually, um, I would first to give you the results from the brightness temperature. So this is an independent verification of the fiber optic temperatures that we recorded with a thermal infrared camera. And you again see these two cables here with the cones pointing different directions. And there's two very distinct areas that are highlighted here in which the temperature between these two cables are different. The first one is highlighted here by blue. It is basically the flat bottom of these cones that is exposed to the flow which has a much lower temperature by about two Kelvin compared to the tip of the flow, the cones pointing into the flow. And then there's this sheltered area at the, protected by the flat bottom of the cones uh, facing away from the flow that is much warmer by about three Kelvin. So basically we confirmed this, uh, the differences by brightness temperature. What we also did is we did some simulations of the flow in the open foam simulations software and what you basically see here, color code is the turbulence kinetic energy. Um, so basically it tells you something about the mixing strength. And these very nicely, these simulations very nicely confirm the mechanism in these blue and red regions. So the blue you see on the left-hand side, the turbulence is much enhanced, more yellowish colors. So hence the heat loss is greater. So the temperature is cooler. And on the right-hand side of the right-hand cable, you see turbulence is much reduced. So heat loss is less. So the temperature of the cable actually is larger. Of course, so we have these two independent verifications and um, what we show here is that of course the temperature that we sense with the fiber optic cable then has certain forces. So what does it depend upon? So we try to understand the system, this microscopic wind direction sensor. So what you see on the left-hand side is the temperature differential now sensed with fiber optics as a function of wind speed. And um, on the left-hand side, you see basically that the heating rate matters. So the more we heat the cables kind of makes sense the higher is the temp differential dif temperature signal. But if the wind speed gets too strong, the turbulence that already is in the wind tunnel washes out the one that's generated by these microstructures, so we lose the signal. And the right-hand side, you see there's little symbols, the little crosses and the triangles, they show different shapes and they show different sizes, and different spacings of these microstructures, so that matters as well. 
and the dashed line here is the representation that fits our experiment results the best. Okay, so so far so good. Um, so we can do this in the wind tunnel. The question, can we actually do it in the field? Well, this is what we've been working on the past two years really hard. And we constructed these support structures with uh, aluminum trussing with eight meter long fiber optic cable sections exposed um, to the atmosphere. You see these two cones, or uh, well, these two fiber optic cables with the cones pointing in different directions that are eight meter long. What I'd like to give you here now is basically the first observations of wind direction with these fiber optic cables for two different situations. And you see basically two 10 minute snapshots um, over these eight meter sections for two different cases. The first one is the flow reversal from westerly to easterly directions by a sub scale actually moving through the domain. And you see how very nicely fine grained and sharp this transition of the wind directions can be actually resolved with a fiber optic uh, technique. And the lower one basically shows an early morning turbulence example so there's much more three-dimensionality to this. So you see much time variability and time and space of the wind direction. So that's really is the developing turbulence as the atmosphere transitions from the nocturnal state to the diurnal state. And with this, I'll end here and I'll turn it over to Carl. Um, Christoph, could you unshare your screen? I'll share mine. Sure. All right, so I'll try to make sure that we stay on uh, within time limit here. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about our Python tool that we use for DTS management, and then I'll kind of do a whirlwind tour of a sub meso motion that Christoph talked about. Um, so we've developed this tool called PyFox, which allows us to take these snapshots of the instrument output and then convert this into this now kind of complex um, geometry that we have here on the right. Um, and so you can kind of see then that there's this interesting shapes in here. And actually I'll be talking about this feature in a second. Um, but within this tool, we can also then output um, additional derived quantities such as wind speed and wind direction, um, which will be soon be added. Um, and I just wanna shout out to the DTS calibration tool that Bart Schilpelroot will be talking about later as it is forms kind of a powerful backbone for our own work here. And the first thing I'll talk about is with these unheated or with these actively heated fibers is that again, they act as like a giant hot wire anemometer. And kind of one of the critical things that we've done is that in the past they've been laid out horizontally and now we flip them vertically. And this removes one of the key constraints for us which was this angular dependence. Um, and in doing so, we've now come out with these really beautiful um, evaluations of the uh, fiber wind speed against this, the uh, like observed wind speed by standard observations. Um, and the, the big difference here I just want to highlight is that there's still some things for us to figure out in terms of the radiative environment as it changes between daytime, cloudy, and clear sky conditions. But now for kind of the whirlwind tour. So this tower that I showed you is at this black dot here within our array. And the array is about 200 meters um, by 150 meters wide. Um, within this then, um, so that's these near surface observations I'm showing, they're about a meter and a half off the ground. In the middle here, we have time height cross sections of the tower. So these observations are shown here for air temperature and wind speed. Below that are sonic anemometer observations of the sensible heat flux. And on the right are 30 second mean profiles between the two black lines shown there. Um, and so the first thing to point out is that we have this cool, interesting sub meso generated burst of intermittent turbulence. This is exactly the problem Christoph highlighted is that we don't know what the driver is behind this. However, we see with the DTS that we have this defined and constrained shape. It's about 60 meters across and it's less than six meters tall. Um, and it moves across the field in about two minutes with a really slow um, velocity. One minute, Carl. Okay. Um, this generates then at the surface, this interesting flow nose. So you kind of see that as the flow, um, uh, as this uh, submeso motion actually interacts with the tower, you get this acceleration of the flow, um, which, is totally missing from the, the sonic anemometer point observations. And additionally, the boundary layer transitions from a uh, decoupled state. So you can see here, weakly stable above and then strongly stable below to a coupled state where you see it's weakly stable throughout. And this is one of these features that has been um, a big mystery for the boundary layer community for a while. And with the DTS, we can directly resolve it here. So that's kind of our exciting new result. All right. <clears throat> 